to see you. Great to see you. Great to have you back, uh, uh, back this year on site. I'm Mike Day. I'm the department head for Animal Sciences and Industries. This is a big week for the Animal Science Department, for the beef industry, and really our animal ag industry um, overall. Started off last night with the Stockman's Dinner to honor Pat Coons, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, a great event, 350, 400 folks there. Our new president, uh, Richard Linton, K-State president came, and uh, I think it was a great event, Angie. We, uh, we, we had a really good time. You know later today at four o'clock, we have the bull sale uh, out at the Stanley Stout Center, the legacy sale, and then junior beef producers hits uh, Saturday morning. So a big week in for us, or a big two to three day stretch. One special edition of today's um, event, for the first time we have the Youth Cattlemen's edition of Cattleman Day, Cattleman's Day. So we have about 100 students in from uh, ag programs throughout Kansas. Uh, we could have had many more, I think. We've filled up in this, uh, uh, in, in our attendance. And, and they're here, they're, they'll be mixed in with us for some of the program, then they'll be, um, um, have some parallel sessions going on that they're gonna work on uh, at other times. So again, it's great to have you here. You know, our two primary organizers uh, at the faculty level, Justin Wagner, Anthony Tarpoff. This is their first year of running this program. I think we put together a good program for you. Slanted it a little more to tell you about a lot of the great work that's going on here uh, in our animal science, in our ag econ uh, department. And uh, so we hope you enjoy your day. Now, one of my charges was not to go over 15 minutes, which I, I, I might be pushing that now. The other was to give an update of the department. And so uh, I've got just a few slides here and we'll, we'll go through these. The very first question I usually get is what is, what is enrollment? What's up with enrollment? We hear it on the news all the time, uh, universities and declining enrollment. This is the ASI major enrollment uh, since 1997, and you can see we're pretty healthy. Uh, you get out here to about 2015, we hit a peak, or we start a peak, a really strong peak right in here, and then a, oh, a little bit of a decline up here to uh, uh, 2021. Not unexpected, but we have started some new recruitment initiatives to just make sure we hold and even grow this, this department. One thing, um, uh, I think down in this corner, 40%, it surprises people that over 40% of the students in this major are from out of state. We, uh, uh, we wanna bring in the best and brightest from Kansas and we are also doing that from across the country. California, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio, Virginia, Georgia. We've got students from all over. We want them to, uh, uh, to come here and I think, I think we offer a good product and that's why we have those folks coming this way. You know, extension is one of the other legs of our mission here. That's what we're doing today. We've got you folks here Extension is, uh, um, uh, uh, is our program. We keep growing. We've got a lot of clients, a lot of stakeholders to work with. So, so that leg is, is an example of that is today. Um, for us to, to sustain our, um, our student population, we really have two major requirements. If we have these first two, that is what will uh, allow us to keep recruiting the Kansas students, bring those students in from out of state. Uh, excellent faculty and staff, modern and accessible facilities. I think sometimes we take K-State for granted uh, when we've been here a while. You can't find any place else where you can go up the road a mile and find the facilities, the animals, the access, that we have up the road. And I think that helps drive this out of state um, 
of this out-of-state enrollment. If you come, uh, some other things we do, I mentioned the recruitment initiative, the youth programs, Junior Beef Day tomorrow, that's one of many. We got Junior Sheep Day coming up, another couple hundred students will be here for that. These are bringing students to not only animal sciences and industries, but really every major across the whole campus. So uh, these are some of the other efforts that we do. Once students are here, these are really important to us. Our competition teams, our undergraduate research, internships, industry experience. We want to grow leaders, grow the next generation of animal scientists, whether they're in production or, or uh, uh, in industry, allied industry or faculty, or veterinarians, uh, there, there are a lot of places that our students go. The other thing I want to mention is uh, research grant funding. And so this is, this is pretty impressive. If you look back in 2015, the department brought in about one and a half million dollars to support research. In 2020, it was over five, 5.4 million dollars. So that's basically tripled over the last five to six years. And, and so our faculty that are teaching and doing research or, and doing extension are doing a great job of earning. Um, uh, or bringing in money to make discoveries. I wanted to highlight again a little note down here. We track research expenditures, how, much, how many dollars we spend on research. So that five million is, is multiplied into $17 million of research expenditure. So we're, we're uh, using those dollars to increase our base even greater. So the research program is going well. Graduate student enrollment, some people look at this and they go, oh, this is, this is of concern. As many contracts as I've signed in the last uh, month or two, I think we're back up to, to where we need to be in the department with about uh, 65 to 70 graduate students to carry the research and teaching forward. We've been going through strategic planning and uh, I think this is my last slide, uh, AJ, so I'm, I don't know if I'm getting overtime yet or not. Uh, um, we, we, we have three main goals. They're pretty simple. We want to be the best animal science uh, teaching department with the best experiences in education in the world. And, and uh, we target that in a comprehensive education. Folks, as I mentioned before, students graduate and go a lot of different directions. We have to be comprehensive to help that happen. Secondly, this word, a lot of people go, what is this? Translational agricultural research. You know, we talked about the animals right up the road. There are a lot of discoveries that get made every day that are, that are basic, they're fundamental discoveries. We're not sure what they need, mean, but we know how this cell functions, what this hormone does at the molecular level. Those discoveries are made every day in animals. At the same time, we want to know how that will benefit beef production. Translational research is looking at these basic discoveries, trying to translate them into technologies or management options that will make us more efficient, more sustainable. And so with the animals, with the location, we're able to translate discoveries into technologies and application, or at least assess whether uh, these discoveries fit. So we want to be the world leader in this area um, with emphasis in animals and food. Sometimes folks don't understand food science is a, a, a major part of our um, uh, animal sciences and industries department. And then goal three, three provide cutting edge outreach education as we talked about before. So that's kind of what we're all about. Um, I'll take a pause right there, AJ or Justin. Um, questions, or do we want to keep going? Any questions from the audience? Oh, 
Oh, I'm patient. I used to teach animal science, uh, intro to animal science for 20 years. I, I, I bet there's some out there that uh, just takes a little while to work it up. So, anything at all? Okay, we'll roll into the rest of the program. Uh, this is the, the slate of speakers, all ASI faculty. Um, and I guess I don't remember the order here. Are these in order? All right. Um, so first up to bat, uh, Dr. Casey Olson. He's in our, he supervises our cow-calf unit. He's in range management, cow-calf range management, forage management. He'll be the first speaker. Uh, Dale Blasey from our stalker unit. Um, spent yesterday afternoon at the stalker unit with our advisory board, the Livestock and Meat Industry Council. That, that's another thing I forgot about this week, and that was a, a good time. Dr. Jim Yard supervises our uh, Beef Cattle Research Center, uh, feedlot and ruminant nutritionist. Uh, and then Dr. Michael Chow, he's in our meat science and our muscle, muscle uh, biology program. And so these folks are going to tell you about what they've been doing, what they're planning to do, and I'll turn the floor over to KC, I guess. Thank you for being here. Clicker boss. Hey, everybody. This is starting to feel a whole lot like normal again, isn't it? Oh, this is great. So, uh, I want to wax philosophic with you a little bit this morning. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, I've been really engaged in the invasive plant realm. Um, you know, anybody that's a landowner or land manager in, in eastern Kansas knows that we have some significant problems with invasive species. And uh, been working on the Cerisi Lespedeza question for quite a while, but uh, got engaged with something else just uh, recently. And you'll be the, the first to see it. So here's my philosophy. Okay, originally there were 165 million acres of tall grass prairie represented by that Rorschach blot up there on the screen. Okay, and right now, only about 4% of that uh, original remains. Okay, right at 6.2 million acres, and uh, four and a half million of it is right here at home, the largest extant remnant of tall grass prairie. And it's special. Okay, this place that we call home, okay, is also home to 500 different plant species, 700 different insects, 40 mammals, including people. Okay, and thousands upon thousands, myriads of microorganisms that are unique to this area of the world. Okay, and and I, sh I say that because on small spatial scales, that makes our area, our home, more diverse than the Amazon rainforest. Okay, and every human being benefits from that diversity, whether we appreciate it or not. Um, so another thing, um, this tall grass sod here is the best water filter on planet Earth, and the best carbon sink on planet Earth. Everybody benefits from that. Okay, and we need to start thinking about how we're going to capitalize on that relative advantage. So, because we're so good at growing stuff here, okay, stuff that doesn't belong here likes to grow here as well. Okay, and, and all invasive plants are annoying. Okay, at least annoying, right? And we know they've been around at least 2,000 years because of the parable of the terrors in Matthew chapter 13. Okay, but only a handful of these invasive plants are, are termed transformers, okay, that can invade an otherwise healthy ecosystem and destroy it. Okay, and Cerisia lespedeza, and those new plants we're starting to think about, the old world blue stems would fall into that category. So I went after this problem starting in 2009 like a good ruminant nutritionist. I tried to intervene on the animal side and uh, met with limited success. But then I started to think about 
Sericeal espadiza and its life cycle and where it might be vulnerable to some kind of management pressure. So me and a, a good team of folks, including Dr. Dale Bossy, we started throwing matches around after the steers had normally left. Okay, and applying prescribed fire either in August or September and just seeing what would happen in a non-grazed ecosystem. So this is August 2nd, 2016, and the camera holder is standing right in the head fire. These are very low intensity fires. There's lots of green stuff standing after the fire passes. But you come back 48 hours later and everything is top killed and has to reboot. Okay, it makes a lot of smoke because there's a lot of water vapor in that smoke. But when we burn at this time of the year, the smoke rises because it's warm. Okay, the nights are still warm, so the smoke stays there. It doesn't descend into Lincoln or Omaha or something like that. Uh, it requires fewer equipment, or less equipment rather, and fewer people than a conventional spring fire. Okay, and we did this for four years at the Moyer Ranch here south of, of Manhattan. And this is what we got. Okay, over the course of that four years, and this is a four year average, mind you, Okay, the basal frequency of Cerisi lespedeza went way down. Okay, not only did it go way down, the surviving plants were smaller, much, much smaller. And those surviving plants did not make almost an iota of seed. Okay, seed production is how Cerisi lespedeza spreads geographically. Okay, seed gets on machinery, it gets on animals possibly, and it moves. But when you take away its ability to produce seed, it can't move anymore, and it can't be invasive. So we did this initially for four years in a non-grazed ecosystem. Okay, and with Dr. Blossie's help, we were able to take this concept to a commercial scale grazing system because the question on everybody's mind, okay, if we move our conventional burn season from April to an unconventional burn season in either August or September, what are we gonna do to yearling cattle performance. Anybody got a vote? What do you think? Okay, and this time, because people always refer to this in the media as fall fire. Okay, it's really summer fire. Okay, but we added a true fall treatment because it's true that it's easier to make a fire carry after that forage has dried down a little bit. But the answer to that question was nothing. Okay, average daily gain, total body weight gain were equivalent between a conventional spring burn and a August burn. Okay, and that was true over a three year time horizon. We hopefully can continue that work into the future. In a true fall season, okay, average daily gains were back maybe two tenths of a pound. You're scratching your chin, Dr. Phoebus. Are you intrigued? Now, look at this. Which side of the video is different? What do you think? So one of the things we noticed when we began work at the stalker unit, there were occasional patches of yellow blue stem okay, in some of our summer fire treated areas. And the next year, we went back after applying fire, we couldn't find them anymore. So um, we got with our very good departmental friend, Justin Jansen, who owns some land out by Canopolis Lake and who has a Caucasian, not a yellow, a Caucasian blue stem problem. Okay, he allowed us to set up 18 one acre plots out on his ranch, managed by his son-in-law, John Kieser. Okay, and we, originally hoped to, to do some consecutive burns on that area. It turns out in that part of the world, consecutive burns are kind of out of the question. So we modified our approach, and uh, this summer, we will have the opportunity to evaluate land that has been unburned completely, that's been burned once, two years ago, or that's been burned twice, two years ago, and then again, last year. And I'm gonna try and run that back for you again. But I am 
failing to work the There we go. Okay, the area in the foreground, this is taken last fall. The area in the foreground was treated with fire two years ago. Okay, the area that we're coming into now in the video, that's a solid stand of Caucasian blue stem. Okay, and that's only about a 35% a reduction in basal cover of, of old world blue stem. Okay, but one treatment that cost 75 cents an acre totally transformed this country. So, and here's the results from pre-treatment year one to post-treatment year two. That's all we've got at this point. But from here to here, that's about a 35% reduction in uh, old world blue stem density. So, uh, more philosophy for you. So, we all love the prairie. Okay, we value it as a component of our business and a source of our livelihood. Okay, but most of the value to society of prairie sod, you can't quantify in terms of animal production or animal revenue. Okay, it has value for everybody. And, and when you're working on a biological invader, understanding its Achilles heels is really, a key, its basic biology is a key to finding its Achilles heels. Now, this is one approach, okay, and it's going to be applied differently by different people, but it's another cost-effective tool that you can have in your toolbox to manage invasive plants like Cerisia lespidiza and the old world blue stems. So, didn't have enough time today to show you the rest of the plant data, okay, but this approach to fire has zero collateral damage. In fact, it has positive influences on the remainder of the plant community. Okay, we get more legumes, for example. We get more wildflowers, okay, when we burn during the late summer compared with the early spring. So here's my parting shot. How'd you like to get paid to grow grass? Okay, with the industry's pledge to be carbon neutral by 2040, Okay, that's going to involve documentation of carbon sequestration and carbon emission. Okay, the best place to store or sequester carbon on planet Earth is right out these doors. Okay, so I think that um, carbon monitoring is going to be a big part of our future, and I hope, to, I hope to be able to move into that area of research in the near future. So I've, I'm done. Are you ready, Dale? Thank you, Dr. Olson. It's good to be here this morning. Two years has been an awful long time, and tell you, looking forward and, and putting into context the age of, of the KSU Beef Stalker Unit. This picture was taken 70 years ago uh, for the 39th Annual Livestock Feeders Day. 70 years ago. It's been a long time. Property's been in the control of Animal Sciences College of Ag for that much, that many years. And since that time, there's been a lot of changes. Uh, Back in the late 1940s, they had the grassland utilization project, and the stalker unit is actually the home of the initial research work done, conducted on spring burning of pasture. So it ties in very well with Dr. Olson's approach in this day and age as we move forward with our unit. Now, over the last two years, getting things done, uh, we, we, we kept right at it. We, we kept our as was said last night, we kept our plow on the ground and we never stopped. And I have two excellent gentlemen out there at the Stalker Unit that do the day-to-day -day activities, coordinate our work with our undergraduate students, our graduate student projects, and I, I, it's only fair to acknowledge uh, Bill Hollenbeck and Kyler Sewer who are out there uh, making sure that we get our things done. Now, there's a lot of things we do out at the Stalker Unit. Uh, as we look at beef stalker and backgrounding production, we have the nutritional aspects, management, and health. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to work with so many great people across our departments in the College of Ag as well as in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, also, we, we also lean on expertise in our industry, 
folks that have been before us, Dr. Frank Brazel, former uh, beef specialist out of Southeast Kansas, still is active in the business today. We rely on Frank's expertise uh, for a lot of good insights to make sure that what we do is on target for you folks out there in the industry. Dr. Sean Montgomery, a former graduate of this department, is a consulting nutritionist. And so we, we lean on Monty from time to time to help us gain insights into our approaches with how we uh, evaluate and set up our treatments and our projects. And our newest uh, uh, a member of our, of our group that we work with quite closely, Dr. Tyler Spohr, recent Nebraska graduate, works for a bio firm uh, east of here, and, and we're excited to utilize the expertise and talents of these three individuals as we go forward into our business. Now, the way I've structured this presentation is I, I reached out to all the colleagues that I work with, that I'm blessed to work with. And so, uh, in this first uh, project uh, uh, with Dr. Evan Tegemeyer's group, uh, Maddie Grant, her colleague Katie, and myself looked at amino acid supplementation for limit-fed cattle, looking at methionine and choline. In a long sense of the word, what we did was limit feed high-risk heifers. We supplemented them with ruminally protected methionine or ruminally protected choline during 60-day receiving trials to look at, uh, to try to attain an immunological response. Uh, as of yet, we have not observed any discernible improvements with administration of this, but it's a three-year project, and we're looking forward to Maddie joining us again this fall to complete her PhD requirements uh, for, for the work that she's looking at here. On the other side of the coin, looking at lysine, uh, looking at limit-feeding growing steers, 560 pounds, using sweet bran out of Nebraska with 0.3 or 6 grams per day, uh, basically a commercially available product known as Smartamine. Uh, what, what Dr. Evan Tigemeyer's group observed was that lysine did in fact increase body weight, uh, a maximum benefit of about 19 pounds over 77 days. And following those cattle, carcass weights were heavier for the lysine supplemented steers after cattle were finished on a common diet. Now, looking at it from the veterinary perspective, my colleague Dr. A.J. Tarpoff, working with Tyler Blackwood, uh, wanted to get an idea of what, from a pain management perspective with these cutter bulls that many of us have relied on in the industry over the years, but right now we understand that the longer you let these calves remain intact, a bigger a problem it is for our industry, okay? So the, 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 the techniques that they looked at, and, and we had a hard time convincing our colleagues at Pratt Feeders to buy us a, a load of feeder of, of, of cutter bulls out of Louisiana. But what we wanted to look at was banding, banding and splitting the distal scrotum, the Berdizo, the Henderson's tool, and of course then we had a negative control group in there as well. The takeaways from this project was that banding uh, castration method for 700 pound weight bulls is adequate. And it certainly is in line with the 2011 NOMS report as the most common frequent castration method at the feedlot. As you would imagine, the more invasive procedures cause greater impacts on performance, and especially in, during the time of the year that we conducted the project, i.e. the Henderson and as well as the band and cut. The Berdizo is, uh, the, the method itself is labor time uh, intensive for this size of cattle. Uh, Dr. Tarpoff swore that he would never touch that tool again for calves that size. Uh, it leaves a, a, visual, a visual scrotum and testicles uh, and we always have to worry about the discounts that exist on the other end of the harvest scale. And of course, environmental conditions played a key role in the outcomes post-castration. Uh-oh. Now, we looked at how we do it in the industry, but from the, you know, as, as, as Dr. Day indicated, we do the translational stuff, but we also have to do basic work. We gotta look into the future. Our, our colleagues over in the College of Vet Medicine, Dr. Hans Kutzia, uh, Michael Klein, Dr. Michael Kleinhens, they're looking at the uh, potential development of an implantable immunocastration vaccine. And now here's how it works. Uh, uh, basically, they, they, they utilize gonadotropin-releasing hormone as an antigen in those bulls. And it's, as I understand it, it's linked as a haptin to a carrier protein and adjuvant and implanted into the backside of the ear, much like a growth implant. 
The goals of this particular project were to demonstrate versatility of the implant and approve upon existent multi-dose uh, strategies such as Improvest, Superlorin, and Bopriva. Uh, where they are at today, uh, January of 2021, they utilized uh, uh, over 30 head of animals. Uh, eight animals were surgically castrated and 23 were ran randomly allocated to one to two treatments. They sampled every two weeks. Uh, they measured a radio amino assay. They collected uh, infrared tech uh, images. And December 2021 and ongoing, they're looking at the outcome. What they have found thus far is that the implant itself is capable of stimulating the production of GnRH. And they have also observed that the uh, vaccine does reduce testicular development and the growth rates are similar to those animals that are surgically castrated. Uh, needless to say though, uh, they've demonstrated that the vaccine can be delivered, but there's still much technology refinement that needs to be conducted. Now, we also work with a young lady, fairly new staff, uh, a faculty member in the College of Agriculture, Dr. Cassandra Olds. Many of you may have already heard. She's, she's very dynamic and has a lot of great ideas for our industry regarding parasites, but she wanted to look at housefly movement in confined cattle feeding operations. Now, hang on to your chairs for this approach. What she basically did was catch the house flies, she caught them, she painted them, and then she turned them loose. If you look at the upper right uh, aerial view of the stalker unit, there's six different colored stars. She painted those particular flies in those locations, that particular color, and then she just turned them loose. The bottom right diagram illustrates the immigration of these flies across the entire facility. Pretty cool stuff, right? What her takeaway message was that fly movement strongly is strongly impacted by food source, i.e. high sugar feeds are a strong attractant. Number two, flies move across facilities. And from an antibiotic pers uh, resistant perspective, that, that's a strong consideration that as our food scientists and and our veterinary uh, folks uh, look at this stuff. It's, that's important to look at. And they also, those flies tend to stay in an area if food is available. Kind of makes sense, right? Now, to some of our work that we're doing directly with the young people that work with me, uh, the specter of drought in Kansas is always upon us. It's upon us now. And so we have to be thinking about strategies to mitigate drought. It's got to be a part of our management day to day. One thing we've taken is a long-standing feeding approach known as limit feeding. It's been around since the mid-1980s. One little modification is, is that we've removed a large portion of starch and have replaced that energy with digestible fiber from our byproducts, such as uh, sweet bran or even uh, wet cake or wet distiller's grains. What we have found since 2016 is that we've been able to dramatically reduce the amount of roughage in the diet, which is a hassle. It's a deal of one in a diet. Uh, you got a more manure to haul. Uh, we also uh, believe we're trying to document how we can do a better job of documenting health detection. And it only stands to reason that if the animal is being fed at a lower proportion of this dry matter intake, if it's not time or and anxious to want to eat when the time presents itself, that presents us the opportunity to do a better job of detecting health. We see upwards improvement of, of efficiency of about 30% or so. Manure output is reduced by about 45%. Other things that we think about from a sustainability perspective, and that's a big word that we're dealing with, is what does it do for efficiency in terms of the length of time required to mix your feed, the number of feed uh, pounds uh, or loads to deliver based upon the energy density of these limit fed diets and certainly the reduction in feeding waste as well. Let me illustrate to you on the far left column is a traditional growing diet. And in this particular case, 45 NEG, uh, a third, a third, a third basically, but comprising about 45% roughage. Our approach has been on the far right where we utilize 13% roughage. And since this slide was created, we've completely eliminated alfalfa 
and are using 13% prairie hay instead. So we're using a prairie hay, dry road corn, a, sup, a, a co-product such as sweet bran, and a supplement. So not very many ingredients going into this particular ration. 10 trials and ongoing, what we have observed with no adverse effects on health, upwards to a 30% improvement in feed efficiency as a consequence of utilizing limit feeding. Now, drilling down with our ruminally cannulated cattle, and that's from our graduate students' perspective, an unfortunate experience that they all get to experience, is we have discovered from the limit feeding, uh, about a 42% reduction in fecal dry matter output. So from an environmental perspective, that's certainly an important case to consider, especially for some of the no-till considerations, some of the concerns with no-till farming operations. Now, other things that we're doing as well, uh, economic framework, and I'm going to have a slide on this with Dr. Tonzer and his former student, looking at subsequent feedlot performance and carcass merit. A uh, young man from Kentucky is looking at influence of shade on diet. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sorry, Zach. Zach DeBoard working with Dr. Tarpoff. Uh, Zach Duncan from Missouri is looking at effects of bunk spacing on performance. A lot of these posters are actually down in the arena, should you want to see them. Morning versus evening feeding during winter. We completed that project. And we actually have a project that's kicking off on Sunday. Zach Duncan, uh, a PhD student shared with myself and Dr. Olson, is actually looking at California almond hulls as a refuge source for limit feeding cattle. Now, because we feed these limit fed diets at upwards of 60 NEG, uh, our concern is are we creating any potential issues with regards to health for these cattle once they move to the feed yard? So, Working with our beef checkoff dollar, we completed some research and we followed these calves completely through Pratt feeders onward to national beef and look at the uh, preponderance of, of liver scores and certainly any influences on quality grade. And we're presently working on this manuscript to get it published, but we saw no impacts from limit feeding during the backgrounding phase following forward with the uh, feedlot phase. This is a slide from Ag Manager. I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with Ag Manager, uh, one of the best websites for information for Ag Econ in the world, in my opinion. But a lot of work and, and some collaborative work with Dr. Tonzer and his former student, student Claudia Hissong, uh, put a lot of great information together, looking at how we can blend limit feeding and sub subsequent effects as we move into the feedlot environment. Now, on the native grass side, understand the stalker unit is just not 40 pens, but it, it is about 1,180 acres of native grass. And as Dr. Uh, Olson in, uh, indicated, we've, we're looking at the impacts of prescribed fire timing, but we're also doing mineral supplementation work. Uh, Madison Fluhoff is presently approaching her second year of two looking at uh, mineral supplementation with Biuret with or with without Bovitec. Her first year's results are downstairs in the arena. We've also, in the recent past, looked at salts and trace mineral sources as well. Uh, Self-fed supplementation strategies, growth implants, or some other approaches that we implement on the pastures as we, we're doing these long-term studies with Dr. Olson. The other thing that's so key to our department, having our animal units so close to, to the campus, is that this is a university resource. And we have open arms with anybody across our college. And these educational opportunities, in this case, uh, Dr. Mickey Ransom and his Agronomy 305 Soils class is out there. We make this facility available for their convenience and the opportunity to learn more about uh, their particular field of interest. And with that, thank you for your time. Well, good morning. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the feedlot research program. For those of you that, uh, I'm, a lot of you have spent some time out there over the years. Um, this facility was initially put together in 1968, following the big tornado that went through this part of the world. Um, it's served the institution very, very well over that time. It's gone through a series of transitions, 
um, over the years, but uh, still much of it uh, remains like it was in, in 1968. Um, our feedlot research program, we, we utilize a lot of people in the process. So we're entirely staffed by students. Um, currently we have 15 or 16 or 17 actually undergraduate students that work out there on a part-time basis. Um, that's the long list on top. Um, and then uh, we also have a half dozen graduate students in our program today. Uh, the ones in uh, yellow here on the bottom are our master students. Uh, the ones uh, shown in green are our doctoral students. And then the two that have the star next to their names, um, those also happen to be managers of our student or of our livestock facilities. Ross Thorne has responsible for the feed intake uh, center, and Luis Fiatosa has responsibility for uh, the beef cattle research center. Um, Adrian Baker, the last on the list there, also was a, a manager of the feedlot up until recently um, and is now uh, focusing on getting his writing done and hopefully we'll get out and get a real job, right? So um, it, it takes a lot of folks and we wanted to acknowledge up front their contributions uh, to what we get done at the Beef Cattle Research Center. I also want to acknowledge uh, a really important partner that we've had for the past 25 years. Um, Back in about 1996, I guess it was, I, I first met with Lee Bork and we had a kind of an issue here in terms of getting uh, cattle uh, for our research program. And ILS and their subsidiaries have basically provided all of the livestock um, that we use at the Beef Cattle Research Center for more than 25 years now. So we're really, really thankful for that relationship. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time going through some highlights of, of the research and uh, I'll reach back a couple of years on some of these and then we'll, we'll kind of show some ongoing stuff and, and then some upcoming projects. Um, so uh, Dale had mentioned a little biotech company that's 15 miles east of here, um, that's MS Biotech. They produce a product, uh, it's a microorganism called Megasphere elsdenii, trade name uh, Lactopro. Um, that product is designed to mitigate problems with ruminal acidosis. We've had the fortune uh, to work with um, them uh, for about 19 years now, I guess, in the development and commercialization of this product. Um, this is uh, one of the first studies that was done with a stabilized, freeze-dried form of the product, which is now what they have in the marketplace. Um, but in the red line, we have animals that are on a control, finishing uh, step-up program, um, and then fed over a period of about 145 days. Um, the red line is the control, where they just go through a standard 21-day step-up program, and then they're on feed. Um, and these would be with flake uh, grain-based diets. The purple um, is animals that had been given a single dose of their Lactopro product on day one of the finishing period. And you can see that the ability to regulate uh, ruminal pH um, is quite a bit better. And so as expected, animals that are um, going through that step-up phase, uh, phase, we sometimes get some low pHs that, that, uh, where they have an, an acute or subacute acidosis. Um, none of that with uh, the Lactopro. More surprisingly is kind of late in the feeding period, some of the heavyweight cattle really drop off on the rumen pre, uh, pH, which can impact feed intakes. Um, we typically think of uh, that uh, 5.2 pH as being kind of a critical threshold. Um, and, and you can see that uh, the group fed the lactopros stay above that. Some of the controls tend to fall below that. Um, we've done a lot of work over the past couple of years with uh, ensiling uh, of grains and forages. Um, some of that is related to uh, evaluation of grain hybrids, harvest date, moisture content of grains and or forages, and then silage inoculants has been another piece of it. Um, so th this is looking at Lactopro again as a silage inoculant, so a completely different application for the organism. Um, and we ap applied it um, and, and fed the silage during a 110-day backgrounding program, and then we followed the cattle through slaughter. And you can see that they're worth just about $20, $29 a head more as a consequence. And the only difference is which silage did they get, the one with or without the inoculant. Um, that's now a, a patent that's pending and we're hoping to see that in the marketplace sometime soon. Um, we've also done a lot of work in, in recent years with a uh, Syngenta, which is a, a, a seed uh, company um, and also chemical control company uh, for, for row crops. Um, they have uh, a, a genetically modified uh, type of grain um, that 
produces high levels of amylase enzyme, which is the enzyme that's associated with uh, the degradation of starch in the digestive system. Um, and this is looking at some silages that were made um, with the Enogen product, the high amylase product, um, versus one that had similar genetics, um, but without the high amylase trait. And you can see this is looking at uh, digestibility um, in situ. So we, we take, uh, suspend bags full of the silage and put them in the rumen um, and pull them out uh, seven hours later. And we see that there's about a 20% difference in uh, the degradation of that material in that seven hour period. Um, and then that's somewhat impacted by uh, the time that the product is ensiled as well, okay? Um, we started, I would say, four or five years ago and embarked on studies to evaluate uh, liver abscess mitigation and, and recognizing that we have, uh, we had the pending issues with um, FDA's action on, on decreasing our ability to utilize some of the in-feed antibiotics, uh, the medically important ones. So this was one of our early efforts to, to try to identify ways of reducing our reliance on antibiotics. And so in this case, um, we have in the red bar, uh, no tylosin. Um, in the diet, um, and these cattle would have been fed for about 120 days. Uh, we have a um, continuous tylen, which is the orange bar, and then the purple bar is where we pulse dose tylen every third week throughout the feeding period. And you can see that we get about as good a control over liver abscess as in any of the categories uh, when we pulse dose versus um, when we feed continuously. And so that was about a 60 percent reduction in antibiotic use over that period of time. We've since followed with a couple of studies where we've tried to on and off isn't so practical, right, in a, in a commercial yard. If you've got to have it in for one week and out for two weeks, that's kind of a pain in the backside. So we've looked at different strategies for maybe using it up front or toward the end of the feeding period. Um, one of those is an ongoing study where we've restricted the use to the first 30 or 60 days on feed in a 150 or 160 day feeding period. Um, and we're measuring feedlot performance, liver abscess, and then timing of the liver abscess as well. When do they develop during the feeding period? And we're just wrapping that study up now and, and hopefully we'll have results coming out pretty quick. Um, part of it was trying to understand when the liver abscess is developed throughout the feeding period. Is it during the step up phase where they're going through these um, radical changes in the diet or is it a consequence of what happens late on in the feeding period? So we tried to employ ultrasound imaging of the liver uh, to, and, and doing that every 28 days throughout the feeding period uh, to understand when the abscesses were occurring. Um, this is an ultrasound image uh, showing an abscess right here. Um, uh, unfortunately, we can only see about 40% of the liver. Uh, much of it is obstructed by other organs. Um, and so it, it turned out to be, I would say, difficult and maybe not a viable means of, of really understanding this very well. Um, we rely, Dale mentioned the corn wet milling products and some of the work they're doing. We rely on, on, on co-products quite a bit in the beef industry. Um, this is a, a flow chart for how the co-products, the, the wet corn gluten feed is manufactured, um, starting with, with shelled corn to produce a high fructose corn syrup or, or uh, a, a starch product or whatever. Um, the wet corn gluten feed is comprised of a combination of bran, steep liquor, and de-oiled corn germ. Um, a study that we have going on right now at the feedlot is investigating those three components separately to try to understand better what their contributions are to the nutritive value of the wet corn gluten feed. Um, and this is a study that's being sponsored by Cargill, um, their uh, starches and sweeteners division, um, and, and they want that information to help them formulate superior types of blends because uh, they have a variety of places that they can go with the individual components. Um, we're doing a lot of work uh, today uh, with grain sorghum. This has been ongoing for several years now, uh, part of a, a USDA-sponsored project. Um, and we have two components. One is uh, looking at uh, commercially available or near available hybrids, so things that are kind of well through the selection process um, and, and in the commercial domain. Um, and then we have a separate component that relates to parental lines 
that have a variety of traits in the sorghum that we may want to take advantage of in breeding and selection programs to produce sorghums that are better suited for use as livestock feed. So this is some work with commercial varieties or, or near um, uh, commercial uh, varieties. We had 39, and um, on this graph, less is more. Okay, so this is looking at the rate of digestion within the rumen of the animal, and we want that to happen very, very quickly. And so we evaluated 39 of these using a laboratory in vitro methodology that, that extracts rumen contents uh, from the animal and evaluates um, how fast that digestive process occurs. And from that, we selected five different um, hybrids. And those were compared to corn, and if you want to see where corn fits within the spectrum of those, um, it's about there. And so we actually have sorghum hybrids that are superior to corn in terms of their digestibility, as well as animal performance. And so we've, we've taken this, then selected those varieties. They were grown out this past year. Um, and here in another month or so, we'll be starting a study to evaluate animal performance efficiency um, with those five different sorghum hybrids. Um, so research that we have coming up, um, uh, we're, like everybody, I guess, uh, thinking about greenhouse gases, right? And um, there's really a couple of important components of the greenhouse gas thing. When animals emit methane, they're emitting energy, right? Valuable energy. And, and in grass-fed animals, that can be 12 or 13 percent of the energy consumption. So it's considerable. So it behooves us to try to identify ways of reducing it because we can potentially recover that in the form of beef, right? So we, we have a financial motivation to try to make this go away. We also have a consuming public that is concerned about it. And we maybe have what's developing is this car, uh, carbon credit system. And we need to figure out how we as an industry participate in that and get paid for that. Um, that starts with identifying means of actually measuring the greenhouse gases, which we don't have good ways of doing that today. Um, so um, we put together a pretty simple system. This is a, a gas monitor that's used in oil fields um, and other industrial settings that allows us to measure nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane, all of which are greenhouse gases. Um, and this is kind of an oversimplified deal, but we just plug it in uh, to the ruminally fissulated animals, and then we can monitor how diet impacts the output of those greenhouse gases. Um, we're, we're looking for systems that are wearable devices. We're trying to develop those. We've got some meetings coming up next week uh, with uh, colleagues in agronomy and bio and ag engineering. Um, and we're trying to get a start on, on developing wearable and affordable devices um, that could be put on animals and report remotely back what that uh, data says. Um, this is some of the output that we get from that. Um, so this is looking at, in this case, uh, CO2 and hydrogen sulfide gas, which is the gas that causes polio and cephalomalacia. Um, but we can do the same thing with um, nitrous oxide and methane and so on. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a project that came to us through uh, NCBA, so it's a, um, a, a project funded by the Cattlemen's Beef Board and then also uh, co-funded by Syngenta. So we've been doing quite a bit of work with um, uh, the uh, Syngenta product over the years, and I guess for starters, um, this is really focused on reducing ammonia emissions from feedlots. Ammonia comes primarily from the degradation of protein and or urea. And we feed large excesses of protein in feedlot cattle. Partly that's because we have to feed excess to ensure the microorganisms in the stomach have sufficient nitrogen to work with. But in so doing, we have large surpluses that end up being problematic. It's an effluent, right? Um, and it's one of the major um, pollution issues that we have coming from feedlots. So this study is targeted how do we decrease ammonia emissions from feedlots. Um, we discovered along the way, this is kind of uh, doing a, a microbiome analysis of animals um, fed a control corn or the high amylase uh, corn. Um, and we were able to discern from this that there were species of organisms, those that revolve around nitrogen utilization, that differed with those two varieties of corn. And so that, that gives us some hope that maybe there's an opportunity for us 
to decrease the total dietary protein, okay? Protein's expensive. Um, urea is even expensive today, right? So if we can decrease protein content of the diet, we know that that's going to have a resulting impact on ammonia emissions. Um, so that's coming up here. Um, uh, we just completed some renovation work out the feedlot with some grain bins. That was completed on Wednesday. We're going to hopefully start loading up uh, the feedlot, and this will be one of the first studies that we get started. Okay, um, for this next one, I want to give you a little bit of context, okay? Um, so um, everybody's aware, I think, that our, our carcasses have gotten bigger, right? And so this is looking at carcass weights over the past 20-year period. These are USDA numbers. And basically, steers in blue um, have gone up uh, carcass weights about 100 pounds. Same thing with heifers. Um, and what you may not know is that cows have gotten bigger too. So that's basically uh, slaughter weights of cull cows. Um, and so we have a, a, a population of cattle that is getting bigger, especially our, our slaughter cattle. Um, and we've also seen concomitant increases in quality grade. And so we went from uh, 20 years ago where about 60% of our feedlot cattle population was choice and prime. Um, today that's um, over 85%, 90%, okay? Um, at the same time, if we look at the blue line, that's yield grade one and two carcasses. The red line is yield grade four and five carcasses. So these are the really fat ones, right? So I would tell you that yield grade has outpaced quality grade in terms of the increases. They're getting fat. We have a lot of surplus fat that we're generating um, in our fed cattle today. If I, if I take that one step further and look at the, the cutout or, or boneless retail yield, um, we've lost a full percentage point in that period of time. So where does that fat go? Well, some of our, our abattoir companies have invested in facilities to make biodiesel from beef tallow, okay? So um, I've done the, the math, and, and to put on a pound of fat towards the end of the feeding period maybe takes us 15 or 20 pounds of feed and it takes eight pounds of fat to make a gallon of biodiesel. That makes a gallon of biodiesel worth 20 or $30, okay? Which is a losing proposition. And there's no way we're ever gonna convince a consumer that that is a sustainable practice, okay? So the solution is we gotta somehow figure out how to get the fat back on the plate, right? 40 years ago, we used a lot of beef tallow in all of our fast food industry to, to fry french fries. Right? So we've got to somehow destigmatize fat is the key, right? Eggs went through this problem. Butter went through this problem, okay? So we've got to get on board and figure it out for beef. Um, so that's basically what this uh, study is about. Um, this is one that uh, came to us through U.S. Cattlemen's Association. Again, it's a checkoff funded program. And it's being co-sponsored by another local company here in Manhattan, NBO3 Technologies. Um, they make an, a co-extruded flax algae product um, uh, that can contribute some uh, healthful fatty acids uh, in, in the beef uh, production. Um, our goal is to create value around beef fat, okay? We don't want to see it as something that is demonized, we wanna see it for the value that it can potentially bring to the human diet. Um, fats are essential. They're in a, as essential as amino acids um, and, and vitamins and minerals. And we have uh, several major classes of fats. A couple of them that we wanna focus on in the study are the omega-3 and the omega-6 fats. These are generally regarded as, as being the healthful fats, the omega-3s. Those are the ones that are associated with salmon and other uh, marine fishes, right? Um, but it, the reality is a balance is what's critical to health, both human health and animal health, okay? Um, there's really two parts of the study. 20 years ago, there was a CBB-funded project done by University of Nebraska where we did a muscle profiling, right? And as a consequence of that effort, they identified that the second most tender muscle in the carcass came out of the chuck. And up until that point, we're selling chucks for about 80 cents a pound, right? So as a consequence of that work, they identified some really neat things that we could extract additional value from the beef carcass if we just broke it down a little bit differently. 
I'm telling you the same opportunity exists, but from a fat perspective. Be fat is not be fat. What's in the chuck is different than what's in the flank, is different than what's in the rib, is different than what's in the brisket. And we need to find the gold nuggets within the carcass that we can create value around the beef fat. Some are going to be more saturated than others, or some are going to be less saturated. More omega-3, less omega-3, more monounsaturated, and so on. So that's the first part of this, um, is to do a comprehensive profiling of the carcass. We want to do 20 or 30 different fat depots. Um, and then uh, we're actually doing this work in collaboration with uh, North Dakota State University and University of Georgia. Um, we'll have extensive uh, evaluation of, of some of the uh, sensory profiling, post-mortem changes, storage and display characteristics, and so on. Um, the second part of the study is we want to feed the animals a conventional diet. And then another half, we want to feed a diet that's enriched with omega-3 fats because we can impart those into the carcass. And, and create carcasses that have a different fat profile, okay? And so that, that's the second part. That's where NBO3 Technologies comes in. They make the LG Flax product that allows us to do that. Again, that's all um, a Chekhov uh, sponsored work and we're, we're grateful for their support. So with that, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. My name is Michael Chow. I'm not as famous as the other uh, presenters, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I grew up in Taiwan and California, so I have a little bit of a unique background because I can speak both language, both Chinese and English very fluently. So when I was a graduate student back in Nebraska, I was often called upon to be a translator when there are people from Mandarin-speaking countries um, such as China or Taiwan or Singapore coming in to do auditing works or even businessmen that's trying to do business with meat company. They needed a translator like myself. So through that process, I actually gained a strong interest in a lot of the um, niche and export meat cuts through this specific process. So today my goal is to kind of take you to a journey of some of the work that my lab has done in the past couple of years. And it all started as the most recent beef tenderness survey showed that 95% of the meat, middle meat cuts are actually considered tender. Wouldn't that be nice to be the end of the story? And the meat, there's no problem with meat quality. And I'm sure that at the end of this presentation, Dr. Day is gonna fire me. <laughs> but, however, there's always a however, that we've got to keep in mind that the middle meat, such as the ribeye, the strip loins, the tenderloins, they're only accounting for about 12% of the entire carcass. And there's still a lot of really tough meat cuts in the chuck, in the round, and the flank region. So. A lot of our work is focusing on understanding these tougher meat cuts. A study done by University of Nebraska showed that there are many commonly utilized beef cuts such as the, such as the bottom round, mock tender, eye of round, brisket, top sirloin, and sirloin tip, that they are still considered as tough. And so, our goal here is really to find a way to better utilize them instead of just having them to go into ground beef. There's definitely better ways to enhance their values. So hence, the specific research focus of my lab is on determining ways to better utilize or even improve the eating quality of these lower quality beef cuts in both very fundamental as, uh, as well as very applied ways. So the first study I want to talk about 
is understanding the biochemical factors affecting East Asian consumer sensory preference of six different beef shank cuts. First thing I want to point out is that I'm sure that many of you have never tried beef shank before, but I want to point out beef shank is in very high demand in the international market. And we actually face fierce competition with beef shanks from many other beef producing countries, such as New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, Uruguay, and however, you cannot find a single documentation on noting what are the drivers for the demand of beef shank cuts. Nobody really knows what these international consumers are actually looking for when they are actually purchasing these beef shank cuts. So our goal here in our lab is to try to find out what are some of the drivers for these consumers to pick these cuts. So what we have done is that we collected six different beef shank cuts from 12 USDA choice beef carcasses. And I'm not going to go into the exact trade name, name of each of these beef cuts simply because that they, there's so much differences in terms of their trade name. But what is very unique about this study is that we actually cook these beef shank cuts exactly the same way as how they are typically utilized, which is in a hot water bath for, at high temperature for about 90 minutes or so to really soften, our goal is to soften up that connected tissue. And we were able to recruit 90 Asian consumers from Manhattan to actually come in and visually evaluate it as well as taste these products and be able to give us some perspective on these different beef shank cuts. And then of course, we were able to measure a lot of the connected tissue characteristics of these beef shank cuts to help us better understand what is that specific relationship between what consumers actually want and the biochemical factors affecting it. So what we have found first is that the connected tissue texture evaluated by these Asian consumers show that the connected tissue texture is actually not related to how much raw collagen that's in these beef shank cuts, but it is actually more related to what is left over after these beef shank cuts have been cooked, which is referred to as the cooked collagen content. And this cooked collagen content is actually directly related to the amount of collagen crosslink, or sometimes referred to as the maturity of these collagen. So as an example right here, out of the six different beef shank cuts, DDFF, this particular beef shank cuts, has the toughest connected tissue texture. And it ended up having the highest amount of leftover or residual collagen content after it's been cooked for 90 minutes at almost close to boiling temperature. And the biochemical analysis showed that, and that is because this is driven by, they have the most collagen crosslink. So which this is leading to that this DDFF again, having the lowest sensory score out of the six different beef shank cuts that we actually evaluated. And on the other hand, when we were looking at the visual overall liking, you can see that again, DDFF is slightly lower than the rest, simply because they were a little bit too big, while this other cuts, FDS, is a little bit lower than BB and ECR simply because they were a little bit too small. And then the DDFH and LMP, again, they were slightly lower on visual evaluation score, again, because they were a little bit too big. So what we have learned from this study is that this perception 
of collagen texture really co is coming from the amount of residual collagen, or what we call them as the insoluble collagen. And what the Asian consumers really want for these beef shank is that they actually want to have collagen, but they want these collagen to be easily um, softened, so which is driven by this collagen crosslink. And this collagen crosslink can really be serve as a marker that they can determine how easily softened this particular beef shank cut is, and they can market them based on these particular collagen crosslinks. And based on our visual evaluation, we found that Asian consumers really do not care about the color of these beef shank cuts, simply because that these beef shank cuts, when you actually look at them, they are pretty much completely covered by connected tissue. So they almost they're pretty much silver. So the color of the meat actually doesn't matter a whole lot at all, but it is really driven by size. The Asian consumers really want beef shank size around one and a half pound or so. Anything that's too big or too small, then that is not exactly what they're looking for. So out of the six different beef shank cuts that we evaluated, I want to point out that about, in fact, five of them are actually suitable for sales in the domestic or international market. I know many of them actually go into ground beef right now, but they can be really enhanced in their value or value added if they were sold in the international market. And then on the other hand, I want to point out that out of the six that we evaluated, two of them particularly stand out in terms of their sensory overall liking. And those two should be marketed as a premium because of their ability to actually soften throughout the cooking process. So the next study that I want to talk about is titled An Investigation on the Influence of Various Biochemical Tenderness Factors on Eight Different beef cuts. And I kind of want to give you a little bit of a perspective here is that we all know that beef price is continuing increasing. And so there are actually more people than ever that they wanted to try different beef cuts for whatever reason that could be due to health or economical reasons. And so we just talked about, however, many of these beef cuts are really inherently tough. So we got to find ways to really help these consumers to learn how to better handle these particular beef cuts that they are not familiar with, or even we are not familiar with. So for par this particular study, we collected eight different beef cuts from 10 USDA beef carcasses. These are top sirloin, ribeye, um, brisket, flank, sirloin tip, eye of round, chuck tender, and clod heart. And then we conduct a sensory analysis using trained panelists to evaluate the various meat quality traits. And then we also measured a bunch of biochemical factors that would, uh, that would explain why these particular cuts have such level of tenderness. And then at the end, we created a correlation or a relationship between the sensory analysis as well as these biochemical factors to really understand why these specific cuts behave a certain way. So after a whole year of research, doing all these different biochemical analysis, we measured things like myofibular protein degradation, the length of these myofibers, the size of these fibers, collagen characteristics, tenderness measurement, and we also did the big correlation study trying to understand that relationship between the biochemical factors with these different cuts. What we can come up with is that most of these cuts that we evaluated, such as 
the clawed heart, top sirloin, and eye of round can really still be improved in tenderness by aging time, just by keeping them in a vacuum package and let them sit in a refrigerated condition for 21 days plus, it can really improve their tenderness. However, there's, there are always some cuts, such as brisket, that no matter how long you age it, it will not tenderize. And that is simply because of their collagen characteristic. They are mainly driven by collagen. So in this particular case, you will have to utilize some extensive, um, extensive force such as using mechanical tenderization or using acid marination to really break down these connective tissue or even through moisty cookery to really soften cuts behaves like brisket. And then surprisingly, we were able to find out there's some cuts, such as top sirloin, their tenderness is really affected by the amount of intramuscular fat. So we can actually improve the tenderness of cuts such as top sirloin by increasing its quality grade. So what we really think is that we should be able to, we should do more research to biochemically characterize all the important beef cuts out there so we can really come up with a very comprehensive guide to tell our consumers what is the proper way of handling different beef cuts. Everybody knows how to handle the mid middle meats, but there are very few people actually know how to handle a mock tender, for example. So I want to kind of touch on some of the ongoing study that we've been working on. One of the ongoing study is we are currently investigating the native beef collagenase in postmortem beef in, to understand postmortem collagen degradation. So we just talked about there are many cuts with a lot of connective tissue in there. So with these cuts that's having a lot of connective tissue, how can we better manage these beef cuts? without using invasive methods such as mechanical tenderization? Can we potentially improve the tenderness of these cuts with a lot of connective tissue by extensive aging, letting these collagenase that's inherently in beef to slowly break down that connective tissue? Or maybe we can do some method to actually enhance the activity of these collagenase in beef to allow them to just break down the connective tissue for you. So in, with the, some of the current data we have, it does show that after 21 days of aging, there are less connective tissue that's being detected by our trained panelists. However, that amount of connective tissue doesn't change a whole lot after that. After 21 days, kind of stays the same following 42 days, 63 days. And our chemical analysis, which is measuring the degradation product of these collagens, kind of show the same thing, that there is quite a bit of collagen degradation product till about 21 day or so, and then really not a whole lot is happening after that. But perhaps the most exciting data that we have currently for this particular study is that we're also finding we can actually significantly enhance these collagenase activity by increasing the zinc concentration in meat, in beef, by just a little bit. So for example, in this case, in gluteus medius, which is the top sirloin, longissimus lumborum, the strip loin, and then the gastronemius, which is the um, uh, heel muscle, you can see that there's not a whole lot of collagenase activity when there's no zinc being supplemented. But in the case that when we, when we add about 20 micromolar of zinc, which is just a tiny little bit of zinc in the meat, we significantly enhance that 
activity of this particular enzyme. However, if we add a whole lot of zinc, then we again actually see a decrease of these particular enzymes activity, which is very intriguing. They like a little bit of zinc supplementation, but they don't want a whole lot. So we really see that there is that opportunity working with the nutritionist here to really understand potentially we can supplement different levels of zinc and understanding how can we actually improve the eating quality of beef cuts with lots of connected tissue. So some of the future research project that I want to touch on is something called accelerated aging. That's something that we're looking into right now. So the process is actually very simple. I'm sure many of you have heard of the term sous vide, which is essentially you put vacuum packaged beef in a warm water bath and let it cook for a very long time. So what we have found is that if we put vacuum packaged beef in just warm water bath, for just about two to three hours or so, it can really stimulate this particular enzyme called the capepsins that it would increase its activity significantly. And it can actually significantly improve the tenderness of these beef cuts even beyond extended aging time. And as you can see right here, just based on some of our preliminary data, after the accelerated aging, or which is they've been putting into a warm water bath, this particular enzyme's activity is way, way enhanced compared to the ones that has not been incubated. So we really hope that we can continue to really work on this particular project and understanding some of that meat quality as well as food safety attributes about this accelerated aging process. And finally, I really want to acknowledge some of the lab members in my lab that they've been working on these projects, including my former and current graduate student, such as Wang Jun Wu, Amelia Welter, we have Larissa, Colin and Haley sitting here. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for uh, all listening through that I, our intent was not to overwhelm you today but to uh, to remind you of many of the different areas that our faculty and the department are engaged in and I think Dr. Day this was just a small sample of some of the research projects that are currently ongoing so we also wanted to stimulate some discussion and so what we'd like to do now is actually invite our presenters back up to the front uh, in each one of them and, and we'll we'll give all of you a chance to ask the questions that you may have uh, and and please keep in mind AJ and I are going to try to run some mics to you we do have two additional groups we have a group in the arena as well as a group uh, of those students that are down the hall here that are also listening into this session so we'll try to bring you a mic and and kick this part of the the program off today so Dr. Day do you have any no, not, uh, not much to add. One thing I want to do uh, right away, uh, you probably noticed the dean of our College of Ag walked in uh, uh, a little while ago. I know I missed your meeting, Ernie, that started at 9, but uh, great to have you there, so, or great to have you here, so thank you for coming. Let's give him a hand. I... You know, you look through those four talks, they're really varied in what they do, but they do a pretty important, they do drive home a pretty important point. The grass resources College of Ag has on hand, the animal facilities we have on hand, the plants that we have on hand, as in the meat lab and the sensory lab, Michael, 
uh, and then the research laboratories. They're all key. You know, you saw some pretty fundamental data from looking at enzyme activity up through the end product and eating quality, and that's, that's that translation that we talked about earlier. So this is a great mix of data and, uh, and excellent presentation. So I think the floor is open for questions, and I'll turn it back over to you, Justin, or... When you, were, when you were talking about the accelerated uh, aging, and you talked about a warm, ba warm water bath, tell me a little bit more about the, the temperature and how long you put that meat in there. Absolutely. The question is about what is the temperature of the accelerated aging as well as the time frame. Currently, we're looking at 120 degree Fahrenheit to 130 degree Fahrenheit. And what we have found is that that is the temperature that this particular enzyme, cathepsin, is particularly favored for. So it, they will have the highest activity at that particular temperature. So what our goal is that we want to keep the beef in there for about two to three hours or so, depending on how much collagen they have to begin with. And then hopefully after accelerated aging, we want to cool it down and then freeze them or even put them in the refrigerator and we should be able to throw them on the grill and then still cook them as how we typically grill the meat on your grill to your desire of doneness and creating the effect that it's tender, but it still has that, what we call mylar reaction, which is that grill marks that gives you that beefy flavor. Casey, you mentioned about uh, burning to control old world blue stem. Uh, in our country, there's, few areas it's really significant where I'm sure a whole pasture burning but what about uh, we're seeing some small areas that I don't know where it came from how it got there but you might just see a patch of six square feet or something like that can we just spot burn those little spots in late summer is it a August burn is that when when is the best time okay I'll try to paraphrase that Thank you, Mr. Perrier. Um, when you have small infestations of old world blue stems, can you patch them out with fire? Answer to that is yes. And when? Best guess is the month of April, because you want the old world blue stems to be deep into reproductive maturity when you apply fire, and the natives to, to not be as deep into maturity. They seem to be vulnerable because they, they raise their growth points Okay, relatively high above the surface of the soil compared with our native grasses. Sorry, uh, August. If I said April, I, I made a mistake. So I, I mean August. My apologies. Oh, this one's way at the top. <laughs> I've got a question for Dr. Blasey on the limit fed uh, deal. Would you anticipate the same, re same results for somebody taking cattle from five all the way to eight or 900 pounds? The question asked is with respect to limit feeding uh, growing calves from five to 800 pounds. We have done that. Uh, our, our sweet spot, we think, with limit feeding is uh, expressed on a dry matter basis about 2.2% percent body weight and so it, it's it, another reference is program feeding and and you can program those calves up accordingly with with the, the limit fed diet specs that I showed during the presentation sure. for somebody looking to turn out uh, you know cattle on grass here in the next 30 to 40 days April 15th um, does limit feeding that much corn, would you have it, would you think there'd be any sort of negative effect on gains when they're taken from a high energy diet onto a more of a forage diet? 
uh, again, with, with the limit feeding diet that, that we're feeding, with the, the, the amount of dry matter, our, our gains are about two, two and a quarter pounds is what we see. So uh, I, I don't mean to confuse uh, everybody with respect to the high energy content, the 60 NEG. We're providing what the calves' needs are according to NRC. So uh, in terms of seeing any impact, uh, compensation, if you will, from calves that were not limit fed versus those limit fed, uh, the answer is no. You'd be fine. water usage, those kinds of things, kind of the plant side of those. Uh, yeah, so a, a big impetus for the sorghum project is water, right? So we have a problem in western Kansas and that we don't have enough of it. Um, so that's actually the main driver behind this. Uh, sorghum is identified by NRCS as a, a, a resource conserving crop. Um, we, we see much greater uh, variability across sorghum uh, uh, parental lines than we than we do with corn, just because they haven't been selected for uh, the uh, millennia that has been the case with with corn. So um, maybe more opportunity to make Im improvements um, with the um, uh, project that we're doing. The, the whole idea is to identify some uh, lines of, of sorghum uh, that maybe uh, lend uh, characteristics uh, that would be. Uh, utilized then by our plant breeders to develop um, hybrids that are specifically uh, targeting the, the cattle feeding industry. Um, we, we, some of the standouts are uh, sorghum uh, hybrids that are either waxy or heterowaxy. So that refers to the type of starch. Um, the, the waxy starches have a high uh, concentration of amylopectin and relatively little amylose, and that affects uh, their digestibility. Historically, waxy varieties were regarded as having some yield drag. Um, in recent years, uh, through the, the development of those, that appears not to be the case with, with some of them. And so um, I, the whole idea of this project is try to not compromise on the agronomic side, but at the same time uh, get some products that are, are better suited for cattle feeding. Some of the other areas that were of interest, um, uh, we have sorghum varieties that are almost boot black in color. Uh, the, the pericarp is really dark. They have a phenomenal amount of phenolic compounds in them. Those phenolics can have antimicrobial activity and very potent antioxidant activity. So we're interested in how they might influence shelf life of the meat uh, from the antioxidant side, but then al also displacement of some of our traditional antibiotic products. And there's a, a myriad of other uh, types of of uh, traits that we can potentially exploit. Uh, there are large seeded um, uh, parental lines of sorghum that are uh, close to what a soybean would be in size. That's been one of the constraints with, with um, uh, use of sorghum in feedlots. Nobody wants to run it through a flaker because it's a pain in the backside. It, it decreases our, our throughput in the flaking systems. Um, if we can get to a large berry, um, we don't have that same constraint. So we have lots of, of uh, I would say, a target rich area for development. In regards to the limit feeding study you did, it looked like it was heifers, is that right? Yes, we've, we've used either, okay. either sex. Was uh, it, were, were there any behavioral changes or were the cattle, you know, satiated and, and satisfied throughout the day, no bullers, great, things like that? The question, uh, any, any, uh, any gender differences in terms of behavior with respect to limit feeding. Uh, a project uh, Dr. Tarpoff and I recently completed looking at the life going into the feed yard, we actually attempted to evaluate uh, behavior, uh, it takes about a week to 10 days to get cattle acclimated to that reduced uh, amount of dry matter provided to them. Uh, observationally, from a behavior perspective, uh, our bunks, when we provide the feed, 
five to six hours post feeding, those bunks are completely, they're clean. Those cattle then, they'll lay down for the remaining 18, 20 hours of the day and they just, they just ruminate. Yeah, the, the behavior is the same. Uh, looking at our activity data using our, uh, our SCR tags that we've used, uh, available from previously Allflex and now Merck, now no longer available, but uh, we've utilized that and, and we've seen no differences with respect to the behavior. On the limit feeding, uh, in light of seven and eight dollar corn, you know, if we can reduce some energy costs there, that'd be great. Uh, the main goal is that to reduce the roughage on the limit feeding, or I know you use a high amount of distillers. I, I just ran the numbers here about two weeks ago for another presentation, comparing an ad lib versus a limit feeding, and I used a hundred and twenty dollar prairie hay, six hundred and fifty corn. Uh, for the sweet brand that we get here, I don't know, it was $100, $120, uh, and it was 78 versus 84 cents, favoring the limit feeding at 78 cents. Uh, you know, energy is required regardless, whatever you do. Uh, but you need to factor in some of the an other ancillary costs involved with roughages. We're all ruminant nutritionists, and, and providing fiber and, and digesting it to the benefit of the ruminant is a great thing. But we have to also accept that in uh, pen conditions, you got the grinding cost associated with it. You got the, the time in the mixing to blend that diet together. Then you got the di dis distribution. And with an ad lib situation, you get startling issues. You get the, the varmint issues associated with that. And then you got to clean the manure. Uh, at the stalker unit, we calculate because we do not put the manure adjacent to our pens. We haul it about 10 miles away. It costs us a nickel plus a head a day to dispose our manure. If we could shave that cost, as I indicated, by almost half, uh, for us, I can tell you Mr. Hollenbeck loves our approach with, with our research, and we're only feeding once a day, too. So, Dale, have you looked at the nutrient composition of that manure in terms of NPK value as fertilizer? The uh, question is, uh, have we evaluated the manure content the, compositionally? Uh, to answer your question, no, we have not. I had heard that there was some advantage with uh, sorghums in in terms of methane production. Is there any truth to that? Uh, so that's one of the areas that we hope to investigate with the upcoming study. Um, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, we have a facility out uh, close to the feedlot um, that's actually part of our purebred beef unit. Um, but we, that, that system's equipped with individual feed bunks that are on load cells where we can monitor individual animal consumption, their behavior, when they eat, how much they eat it, how much they drink, and so on down the line. Our goal is to adapt that system to where we can do measurements of methane on individual animals. In, in response to your question, based on some of the compounds that are present, and we have a little bit of evidence that maybe it, it could be feasible to decrease methane directly as a consequence of, of some of those components of the seed coat that would distinguish it from corn. So I would say jury's still out, um, but it's, it's certainly an area that we want to evaluate. Okay, see, um, some of the earlier, at least a few years ago, research I thought um, was shared was that, <clears throat> that some of our desirable species um, have a negative impact on the, um, uh, their presence in uh, the, the, I'm sorry, uh, in the pasture when, um, burned in August, um, particularly big blue stem. Is that, has more recent research shown that that's not the case? Let's 
So I'll paraphrase again. Does uh, does burning during late summer, early fall have any negative impact on uh, native grasses or any other native plant uh, relative to spring burning? And with a with a true summer burn season, there is no negative impact on anything. It's only positive. Uh, really, don't see any effect on the major forage grasses at all. But some of the incidental plants that we that are very visible in the ecosystem, but they don't really have um, much of a presence in terms of basal cover. And I'm thinking of, of uh, um, the prairie clovers, for example. There's a family of those, the wild indigos, um, uh, slim flower scurf pea. Okay, those are, those are all legumes. They enrich the soil. They're not all important diet components, but we get more of them. Okay, and the part of the ecosystem that really needs those plants as a, as a food source Okay, are invertebrates. And if we have invertebrates there, we have birds. Okay? With a true fall burning season, there is some negative outcome with Indian grass, but Indian grass alone. Uh, and that has to do with the physiology of that plant. So um, as it matures, its tillering gets more and more intense and it actually peaks right before it goes dormant. And when you put fire on Indian grass, as it's about to go dormant, and this would be in the month of October, for example, you can hurt it and you'll get less of it. Michael, any thoughts on how to pick the best brisket in the retail case? I've always wanted to ask a muscle biologist, meat scientist that. Uh, what we have learned is, uh, sorry, the question was, how to pick the best brisket? And what we have learned that no matter what quality grade of brisket you pick, they are, if you don't cook them correctly, they will be tough. And that's just the inherent nature of this particular beef cuts, that they have so much what we call paramecium, which is basically intra, intramuscular connected tissue that just spread out in that particular muscle. And really the only way to soften it is either you smoke it for a very, very long time or cook it in hot water bath for a very, very long time or blade tenderization or acid marination. A related question to that on the, uh, uh, the accelerated aging. Is that a terminal process? I mean, you're heating that product up. Does it have a shelf life? I see Dr. Phoebus up here. Does it have to go right to the grill or can it go back in the fridge or back in the freezer? So there's a reason why it's called future study. <laughs> And that is because we don't know the re we don't know yet. <laughs> but however, just based on what we have done on the preliminary stuff on lipid oxidation wise, um, it really doesn't affect the taste. It shouldn't affect the taste because they stay in a vacuum package bag this whole time. They were never exposed to oxygen. So even when the heat even it's being incubated, even maybe some of the fatty acid is being broken down. As long as you don't expose it to oxygen, then it shouldn't affect its taste. We do not know about the microbial component yet. I'm sure that's what Dr. Phoebus is very interested in. And we hope that we can learn about it in the near future. Are there any uh, final remarks before we, uh, we've covered a lot of different gamut from all areas of, uh, of beef cattle production from start to finish, uh, but if there's no, going once, going twice, uh, if you'll join me and thank our speakers uh, this morning.